I am here today to share with you some good news that makes me very optimistic for the future of our planet. Would you guys like to hear some good news? 2.6 billion people who spend on average an hour a day playing video games. Some people look at this number and they think maybe that's too much time to spend playing games when we face so many real urgent challenges as a planet. And I will concede that people who have this concern, they, they do have some compelling statistics on their side. You know, for example, the fact that we currently spend 1.75 billion minutes every day crushing candy in the game Candy Crush Saga. Um, I may have put a few of those minutes in backstage. Um, to put that number in perspective, that's the equivalent of having a company with 3,645,833 full-time employees whose job is to do nothing but play Candy Crush Saga. That makes them the largest workforce in the world. You would have to combine the top three companies in the world to get a workforce as dedicated and productive as Candy Crush Saga players. But I think the idea that video games are a waste of time, I think this stems from a, a misconception that many of us are taught from a very early age and we live with our entire lives. And I, I'd like to test this hypothesis with all of you um, by playing a little game together. So I'm gonna say a word and then I will point at all of you and I want you to say the opposite of whatever word I say. So if I say hot, you say day, work, Okay, that is the misperception that most of us are taught from a very early age and we hold on to for the rest of our lives. But I wanna suggest an alternative to the idea that play and work are opposites. I wanna suggest that the opposite of play is not work. The opposite of play is depression. Now, I'm not the first person to think of this. This is actually a quotation from a psychologist of play named Brian Sutton Smith. He studied play before there were video games. He started in the 1940s documenting the psychology and social effects of play in children and adults. And you notice that when we play games, we have access to a really wide range of positive emotions. Emotions like curiosity about what will happen next in the game, or excitement as we get caught up in the action, or pride in our accomplishments, delight at how the game is turning out. And he noticed that when we play games, we have an easier time connecting with the people around us, that there's something about agreeing to play by the same rules and bringing our attention and energy to the same goal, even if we're on opposing sides of that goal, something about that makes it easy for us to connect with strangers, connect with our loved ones. And finally, he observed that there's something physically energizing about play, that we can start playing a game, whether it's a sport or a video game, and we can put in so much energy and so much effort, and hours later, we have more energy than when we started. Now, if you were to reverse all of this phenomena, you would get a state where you are pessimistic about your abilities, chances to succeed and improve. You would have a hard time accessing positive emotions. You would have a hard time connecting with the people you care about, let alone strangers. And you would lack the physical energy to engage in everyday tasks, let alone difficult goals. And this, of course, is a perfect description of depression. So we had this intuition that gameplay is the opposite of depression. The same two regions of the brain that are chronically understimulated, they do not get blood flow, and they even shrink in size over time if we are depressed. Those same two regions of the brain are chronically hyperstimulated by video games. They get intense blood flow, and those same two regions grow in size and increase in gray matter over years of playing video games. Let me show you some fMRI footage. This is what your brain looks like when you're playing video games. So with fMRI, the hot colors mean there's a lot of blood flow to those regions. The lighter colors are a little blood flow if there's no color. There's no blood flow, and this gives researchers a really good idea of what's happening in the brain. This is probably the single most replicated and validated finding in game research. Every time you make a move or make a decision in a game, two regions of the brain fire up instantly. 
The first region, it's labeled here as the caudate thalamus. This is often referred to as the motivation or the reward center of the brain. When this part of the brain gets a lot of blood flowing to it, it's because your brain anticipates the possibility of something good happening. So forget about games. Let's imagine that you're smelling your favorite food. This part of the brain will fire up and it will give you the energy to go find where this smell is coming from so that you can eat it because you anticipate that wonderful taste. In video games, every time we make a move or take a turn, we anticipate that we might be successful. So the brain gets excited, it says, let's find out, did I hit the object I was aiming at? And this can happen up to 60 times a minute when you're playing video games because you're making constantly new decisions and taking so many turns. So the more this part of the brain is strengthened and activated, you're gonna keep engaged with your goals, even if you're frustrated, even if you have setbacks. And that's why someone can play a level of Candy Crush Saga 30 times in a row and fail and fail and fail, but they wanna try that 31st time because this region is so activated. Now, is this a good thing? Do we want to keep trying even when we fail again and again and again. That's when we get to the second part of the brain that is chronically hyper-stimulated by video games. This is the hippocampus. This is the part of the brain associated with learning. Every time that your brain perceives that you are in an environment where you are going to get feedback that is useful to you, information that will help you improve a skill or make a better decision so that you are more likely to achieve a goal. Your brain powers up the hippocampus and this puts your brain into a kind of learning hyperdrive. And the brain only does this when it perceives that it's in an environment that's gonna give feedback that you can use in the future. When we're playing a game with someone in the same physical space, or even when we're watching someone else play a game that we know how to play and we're in the same physical space with them, all these weird things start to happen. We start to make the same facial expressions as each other. We start to breathe at the same rate, which researchers know because they put this apparatus on players and, and bystanders and measure how deep or shallowly they're inhaling and exhaling and also how fast and how slow. The heart rates of the players start to adapt to the same rhythm so you can actually measure the beats per minute and they will converge on the same beats per minute. And if you hook them up to an EKG monitor, you will notice that the same regions of the brain are experiencing the same amount and degree of electrical activity. So their neurons are actually starting to sync up and mirror each other. Dozens of studies have shown that every time we sync up with someone in this neurological way, in this physiological way, we like them more. We're also more likely to offer help to someone that we've synced up with or ask them for help to see them as an ally who can assist us in the future. We will have more empathy and compassion for them. We literally feel their pain more. There's wonderful experiments where they'll have people play a video game together and then they'll do something painful to one of the players and they'll ask the other player, how much pain do you think that person is in? And we also perform better on cooperative tasks with people after we played a game together, right? We're synced up, so we're better able to communicate and empathize and, and relate together. So this is another kind of superpower that gamers are building up today because we spend so much time playing games with people that we know in real life, and half of our time is spent playing physically co-located with other players so that we can sync up with them in this really powerful way. That's why we see people develop such strong social interpersonal relationships with people that they play games with. It is such a wonderful way, whether it's parents playing with their kids or spouses and romantic partners playing together, siblings playing together, coworkers playing together. We see a lot of benefits to this. I invented a game called Super Better, which I invented first to help my own brain heal. And since then, more than a million people have played online versions of this game that we've been able to collect data from. And I have to tell you, it's not just Super Better that changes players forever. It's all video games change the players forever because it changes how our brains work, how our brains are wired. And that's why I think it's extremely good news that we have 2.6 billion people on this planet practicing for an hour a day how to sync up with each other, how to activate a super empowered hopeful mindset. And I hope you will join me in this journey to teach gamers how to bring this mindset to real challenges in their everyday lives. Thank you very much. Thank you.